What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast, and we will be diving into the infamous Hellfire Club. Throughout the centuries, dozens of rumors surrounding the Hellfire Club have spread, including drunken orgies, black magic, meetings with the devil even, and human sacrifices. They often met at the George and Vulture Pub in London, which has been around for centuries, still exists today. Even the infamous occultist, Aleister Crowley, carried on the club's motto, Do what thou wilt. They chanted the Latin phrase, Penitento non penitentio. But to make it even more mysterious, Francis had tunnels and secret chambers excavated beneath the building. And they head into a maze of tunnels, dead ends, and secret chambers. And during their meetings, they always left one seat open, just in case Satan himself wanted to attend. Life out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. In the studio, I'm joined by my co-host, Austin. What's hey, up, man? man? How's it going? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. And our producer, Daniel. What's up, man? Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Today, we are back with another episode, and we will be diving into the infamous Hellfire Club. It's a The Hellfire Club, just in general, is very interesting because there's a couple different instances of it popping up and and seeing if there's connections between the different instances of this club and there's the hellfire caves outside of london yeah there's a there's about three but they think there was dozens of potential chapters that yeah. were offshoots but yeah as, as far as we know it's hard because records have been lost and it's such old history but as far as we know there were like three main ones because it's really a secret society yeah from its its inception and I don't even think we fully know where it started, right? Like there's, you know, based on the limited history that we have, we have a few ideas, but it seems like all signs point to Freemasons kind of being at the, the helm of this club. Yeah, in like the first iteration, they think that the Freemasons were actually holding meetings kind of in parallel to the Hellfire Club in Ireland. Yeah. And the Hellfire Club has this sort of sinister connotation to it like that they were getting together to just do evil shit yeah they wanted to be actively against the church that was like their big goal sounds like a interesting place yeah and we'll, we'll get into the the levels of, of uh, reported evil that went on there but these caves are are very very interesting Actually, a YouTuber or YouTube channel I, I watch quite a bit, Sam and Colby, uh, a few weeks ago, they just posted their paranormal investigation of the Hellfire Caves. I saw that. Yeah. And it's pretty spooky in there, man. Yeah. A lot of wild stuff. Yeah. So we'll be diving into that today. But before we do, I wanted to remind everybody, check out the merch collection. If you haven't already, we still have some items left. The Cryptic Collection is, I think actually we've sold out of leave two of the designs already i think mothman's completely sold out and then wendigo did really well i think we still have a decent amount of black shuck and jersey devil left but once they're gone they're gone forever because we'll be working on some new stuff here soon but another way to support the show absolutely free just make sure you're following us on spotify subscribe on youtube and on our socials at lights out cast with that being said let's just go in and dive into the history of the Hellfire Club. We live in a subscription society. It seems like pretty much everything you buy or service that you use has some sort of subscription model. So it's really, really easy to sign up for things and then completely forget that you're paying for them. And for me, canceling subscriptions is always a huge pain in the rear. So thanks to Rocket Money though, they have completely changed the game when it comes to managing your subscriptions as well as your personal finances. I've been using Rocket Money for the past year and I absolutely love how it organizes all my finances all in one app. And best of all, it organizes all the expenses by category and I'm able to actually see what subscriptions I'm actually paying for. So with Rocket Money, all you gotta do is hit a button 
and Rocket Money won't go and cancel that subscription for you, which is absolutely amazing. There's no getting on the phone or spending all this time to cancel your subscriptions. You can do it super simply from the Rocket Money app. Over 3 million people, including myself, have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Seriously, if you don't have this app, give it a try. You won't regret it. It has saved me tons of money and it'll do the same for you. It's definitely in my daily rotation of apps I use on my phone. So check it out today. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel on one subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Download it today. Rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Naming an organization the Hellfire Club might be the most obvious clue that its members were up to no good, right? The second clue was that members were all 18th century, ultra-rich men obsessed with alcohol, sex, and of course, secrecy. And the third would be that they gathered in underground tunnels like rats. Throughout the centuries, dozens of rumors surrounding the Hellfire Club have spread, including drunken orgies, black magic, meetings with the devil even, and human sacrifices. And most agree that these rumors ride the line somewhere between fact and fiction. Well, let's see about that. The Hellfire Club began as a small social clique in Dublin, Ireland. It was founded by Philip Wharton, the first Duke of Wharton in 1719. He was in his early 20s and he was known for his growing feelings of angst toward the Catholic Church. And this angst brought many of its earliest members together. When Philip was thinking of a name for his club, he wanted it to sound like a rebellion against the church. So what other way to do that than naming your club the Hellfire Club? which this played into the idea that the members were condemned to hell and their meetings were focused on sin and blasphemy. But many of the earliest members just used the club as an excuse to drink heavily, especially Philip. They met at the Eagle Tavern in Dublin where other secret societies like the local Freemasons met. Their original meeting spot was also a place where locals would meet after sundown and have a few pints after a hard day's work. While inside the tavern, gambling was common on the Sabbath, and they also read books banned by the church. At the time, these acts were seen as some of the gravest sins possible, and they were the reason dark rumors began to spread at a time when the church had such a huge influence over Europe. In early 1700s Europe, the Catholic Church absolutely dominated the continent, but social change brought a rise in Protestantism. And the Age of Enlightenment brought free thinkers. Scientific breakthroughs and rational thinking began to change the way Europeans saw the world. And as their worldviews changed, so did their faith. Many no longer wanted to blindly follow religion like they had for so many years. Around the same time, coffee houses became a popular, safe place for thinkers to gather. Here, many young scientists and philosophers talked about life's biggest questions. And many of these questions were directed at the church's teachings. Soon, the coffee house owners had to protect the patrons from church members who tried to disrupt their meetings. So they began asking a series of questions to everyone who tried to enter. Only the true patrons were allowed in. And this was how the earliest secret societies in Europe formed. Soon, these clubs became a sign of high social standing. Over time, a lot of the clubs had nothing to do with deep thinking or scientific discussions, though. And they became more about status and wealth. The secrecy was part of the fun. So Philip and the members created hand signals only they would know. And the more secrets they had, the more wild the rumors became. It wasn't long before locals accused the Hellfire Club of Satanism, black magic, and even human sacrifice behind closed doors. Like we said, we were talking about not much is known about the club's earliest days because a lot of records has been lost and we're going pretty far back in history. And like you were saying, there's a shroud of secrecy around the club. That's kind of the whole point. So, um, but one thing that's really agreed on by historians, at least in this earliest iteration of the Hellfire Club, is that the members just loved to drink. That was like, let's just get loaded as much as we can, as well as blaspheming God. That was kind of like secondary, but they loved to drink. And their meetings often began with this cocktail called Skalthine, I believe it's pronounced. And it's this. It's whiskey that's brewed in butter, and it's added with some brown sugar, pepper, and I think that's it. Um, how does that sound to you? Does mm. that sound good at all? I think I'll pass on that yeah, one. Yeah, I might ask, pass on that too. It kind of just seems like 
a typical bar these days. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. right? Yeah, just lots of blaspheming, and <laughs> yeah. drinking, <laughs> drink, weird drinks. cocktails. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just wild to think about the time period though, where you couldn't be outspoken about or question the church. You know what yeah. I mean? The like church had such a grasp on society and controlled it in many ways and brainwashed so many people yeah. into thinking one way. It almost seems like, I mean, there's different versions of this club today in you know different names, but it seems like, for example, I think of the Satanic Temple and kind of their whole thing is like freedom of religion, right? right. And being able to, and the fact that religion is so, especially Protestantism is very widespread throughout our government. And so their whole thing is, it should be, there should be a separation of church and state. And they, that's pretty much, and it's pretty much what they believe is like, this should be, everybody should be able to believe what they want. And there shouldn't be any Christian influence in, in the government and things like that. I mean, they're not like underground or a secret society or anything like that, but it's just, it's interesting that elements of the Hellfire Club exist around the world in different forms. And, you know, it's just wild to think about the not being able to just go out in the public and say whatever you want. Yeah. And that's a good point you bring up. I mean, and that's kind of the whole foundation of this too, is because yes, they're just getting loaded and they're blaspheming, but yeah, a lot of it's to try and strip power from the church, which, yeah, like you were saying, is heavily ingrained in the government. And so why the the irony is that they had to be secret and that all these crazy things, these rumors and all these blasphemes and stuff like that and reading banned books were heightened in this club because the church had such a strong right. influence on it, right? Like, I don't think there would even be this much backlash if there wasn't such a chokehold by the church. Right? right, right. It's clear that drinking, especially drinking in excess, was a very common thing in the Hellfire Club. And so when these rumors start spreading, you know, that these are evil people and they're doing evil things, they really wanted to lean into it. So they started calling themselves devils because they wanted the locals to believe they were sinners who worshiped demons while cursing God. And during their meetings, they always left one seat open just in case Satan himself wanted to attend. As one of the earliest known legends goes, sometime in the early 1700s, an Irishman stopped by the old tavern. He was looking for a cold pint and a card game. After ordering from the bar, he noticed a newcomer sitting at the card table in the corner. He wore a dark cloak with a hood that concealed most of his face. But the stranger seemed friendly enough, and the Irishman figured he would make some money from a few easy wins, so he joined the table. The Irishman won the first round and the next, and the next. But after each win, the man ordered another pint. As the beers flowed through him, he accidentally knocked a few chips off the card table. And as he reached down toward the dirty floor to grab them, he noticed something odd about the stranger across from him. The stranger didn't wear any boots, and he had goat hooves where his feet should have been. The Irishman could barely believe his eyes. As he looked up at the stranger, the figure's eyes glowed red beneath his hood. There had always been talk around town that the Hellfire Club had an open invitation for the devil himself, but the Irishman thought, those are just ridiculous rumors. The Irishman then watched as the figure across from him disappeared in a ball of smoke. The man was so shocked, his heart stopped, and he collapsed to the tavern floor and literally died right there. The earliest Hellfire members fully embraced satanic rumors and stories like this one, and to play into it, they would wear black cloaks carry torches and roam the forest at night, just to scare the locals. Inside the tavern, their secret ceremonies were supposedly so unholy, they would drive people to insanity. One legend tells of a Dublin farmer trying to spy on the group at the Eagle Tavern. During one of the meetings, he walked around the building, hoping to overhear their conversations or catch something through their windows, but someone spotted him. When the devils caught him, they dragged the man inside. If he was so curious about what they were doing, they would give him a first-hand experience. And when the man was later released, he had permanent psychological damage. His family found him the next morning wandering aimlessly through his fields. When they asked him what had happened, he couldn't speak. The experience was so terrifying, he couldn't explain anything that had happened during the Hellfire ceremony, and he never spoke again for the rest of his life. The more stories like this spread, the more interested people became. But this also meant they created more enemies. 
One time a member of the Freemasons threw a dead goose down the tavern's chimney and smoked all the members out. But Philip, the Duke of Wharton, enjoyed the pranks on his club. He saw it as a sign that his club's popularity was growing, and he actually ended up joining the Freemasons in 1722, and a few months later he became a Grand Master. And he was so consumed by the Freemasons he didn't even bother with the Hellfire Club anymore, so the original group slowly disbanded. But this wouldn't be the end of Hellfire. It had become popular enough that other branches had opened up across Ireland. The problem was, the new branches were inspired by the old rumors, so these new offshoots were genuinely interested in Satanism, the occult, and dark rituals. In 1735, the first Earl of Ross, 33-year-old Richard Parsons founded a chapter called the Irish Hellfire Club. Richard was known for dabbling in the art of black magic and the occult, and it was rumored that he referred to himself as the King of Hell, and he even wore a winged devil costume during the meetings. He purchased a large plot of land from Philip called Montpelier Hill, and it was rumored to have an old Neolithic tomb beneath the surface. Supposedly, the original landowner had excavated the tomb and used the sacred stones to build the Connolly Hunting Lodge. This became the meeting spot for the Irish Hellfire Club, and many believed the lodge was haunted because they had disturbed the burial site beneath it. Just like the first chapter of the Hellfire Club, the dark rumors drew a lot of attention. One night, a curious local minister snuck into one of their meetings and hid in the corner. He watched as the members wore black robes and prayed to a large black cat on an altar. It's believed that some of these cats they prayed to during their ceremonies were later used for blood sacrifices, but this one was spared. After the ceremony ended, the minister believed that the cat was possessed by the devil, so he performed a brief exorcism. As he began to pray, the cat shredded into pieces and a demonic figure emerged from its carcass. The giant figure flew up and smashed through the thatch roof above. The minister fled the hunting lodge and never returned. When the members found the thatch roof with a massive hole in it, they feared it was because they had disturbed the old burial site. Instead of moving operations, Richard replaced the roof with a stronger, barrel vaulted ceiling. He figured if the place was truly haunted, it was better for publicity, and he loved building up his reputation as an enemy of the church. He also loved playing pranks on the local clergy. He was known for inviting priests to his home, and when the clergy approached, Richard would open the door completely naked. But his pranks didn't even come close to the actions of another Hellfire member, Henry Barry, Lord Santry. Henry was an alcoholic like many of the Hellfire members, and the more he drank, the more cruel and violent he became. It was well known he had a chairman that carried him and his throne throughout town, and one day the chairman fell ill and couldn't carry Henry around. So Henry cornered the man in his house and gave him a quart of brandy in order to help his illness. He forced the man to chug the entire bottle in front of him. The chairman did as he was told, and he soon passed out in his bed. As punishment for being ill on the job, Henry ignited a torch and set the man on fire, killing him. Henry wasn't just seen as a murdering psychopath. People also thought he was crazy because he was involved with the Hellfire Club. He was never prosecuted for his crime because he had a way of bribing witnesses with large sums of money to keep them quiet. He wasn't arrested until another violent encounter at a Hellfire meeting. While drunk, Henry drew his sword and stabbed a tavern employee who had laughed at him. After the murder, the bribes only worked for so long. Even though the club thrived on its dark reputation, it didn't need someone publicly murdering people. So a few members ended up turning Henry in. At Henry's trial, his defense claimed that the victim had survived for six weeks after the stabbing and actually died from a rat bite, not a sword wound. But the jury didn't believe him. Henry then became the only member of the Irish House of Lords to be convicted of murder, and he was sentenced to death. But with all the support of high-ranking friends and family, he ended up escaping the death penalty. His wealthy uncle threatened to cut off Dublin's water supply if Henry was sentenced to death and his supporters argued that Henry had only killed someone with low social standing, so the crime wasn't really that bad. Henry ended up receiving a full pardon. But after this, the Irish Hellfire Club struggled to recover. By the end of 1745, the public and even the club's own members were more disgusted with the Hellfire Club than ever before, so their membership numbers tanked. Plus, its older members suffered from poor health after years of heavy drinking. So the Hellfire meeting soon became a club for old, dying men. A few years later, a man named Simon Latrell, one of the few remaining Hellfire members, also led to the end of the Irish Hellfire chapter. 
Simon had impregnated a woman named Darkie Kelly, the manager of a Dublin brothel. She tried to blackmail him with information of an illegitimate child. So in return, he accused her of being a witch and a serial killer. She was soon found guilty and actually sentenced to death. During her execution, she was strangled half to death. Then they lit her on fire to finish the execution. When locals finally heard the true story of the unborn child, this was the last straw for the Irish Hellfire Club. The club's time in Dublin had run its course and the chapter permanently closed. Hundreds of years later, the hunting lodge still remains on top of Montpelier Hill to this day. It's about a 30 minute drive south of Dublin's city center and it's been abandoned for several decades now. But people still come to visit the lodge and hike the nearby trails. Many believe occult rituals from centuries ago have left behind traces of dark energy. It's said that if you wander near the lodge late at night, you can smell sulfur, and many experience strange sensations as they walk room to room. After the fall of the Irish Hellfire Club, the secret society lived on, and it soon found its way to London. This new branch's founder, Baron Francis Dashwood, loved rebelling against church authority. As a prank, he once got a minister to stroll through the gardens at his estate. As they walked along the narrow pathways between the hedges, the minister noticed the garden layout was nothing like he had ever seen. But Francis told him it only looked strange from the surface level. The best way to experience it was from above. So he took the minister up to a tower to see the garden from a bird's eye view. Several stories up, the minister looked down and saw the garden was in the shape of a nude woman. And the fountains made it look like milk was pouring from her nipples. A third fountain between her legs made it look like she was urinating. As the minister fainted from the sight, Francis laughed hysterically. Francis then poured a mix of brandy and sulfur down the minister's throat. And when he came to, the minister asked Francis what was in the mysterious concoction. Francis told him it was a concoction of brandy and sulfur he invented, called brimstone. These stories about Francis spread. The old hellfire rumors of devils and perversions started up again, and Francis's public pranks continued. One time a large Catholic mass was being held somewhere in Italy, and as the people sat in their pews they noticed a strange figure dressed in a massive dark cloak sitting near them. The figure's hood was large and he tilted his head so no one could see their face. Halfway through the services the figure stood up and charged the altar. From his hip he pulled out a coiled whip, and once he had gotten everyone's attention he promised to give everyone their penance before judgment day, and then he just began cracking that whip in the air, emphasizing each word he said. The onlookers thought the devil himself had appeared in the church, and in a panic, the cloaked figure chased them all outside. A few men eventually tackled and restrained the figure, and when they pulled back the hood, they saw it was only the Baron, Francis Dashwood. Francis became known for his pranks against the clergy and churchgoers, but in private, he often struggled with his faith and spirituality for years. Sometimes he would publicly mock God, but other times his family would overhear him praying and weeping in his private quarters. But besides his crisis of faith, his two highest priorities was drinking heavily and having anonymous sex behind closed doors. So the new chapter of the Hellfire Club became his sanctuary. They often met at the George and Vulture pub in London, which has been around for centuries, still exists today. It was originally used as an inn built in 1142, but by the 1700s, it was used as the meeting place for a handful of secret clubs. And when the Hellfire Club met there, just like the original iteration, remember the Scalthine? They had some new signature cocktails here. They served, one was called the Gin and Sin, and the <laughs> other one was called Strip Me Naked. Wow. They even later referred to each other at, by the bottles they could drink of, I believe it was, it was port wine. So if you could sit down and drink four bottles of port wine in, in one sitting without passing out, they called you a four-bottle man. Ooh. Yeah. So that's how they referred to each other after a while. <laughs> By how much you could, how much alcohol you could slam. Yep. In London, Francis had created the Order of the Knights of St. Francis. Even though it technically wasn't the Hellfire Club, many still referred to it as a Hellfire Club because of its similarities. Francis was against having this label at first, but the members played into the rumors and again often called themselves devils, just like the original club members. With this new version, Francis wanted to rebrand the Hellfire Club. Instead of just being a club for drunks and gamblers, Francis wanted to create a secret society of elites. So he handpicked 12 original members. 
Each was given the name of one of the twelve apostles, and they dressed like monks. As the leader, Francis called himself Christ. In the beginning, only male members were allowed, and Francis was able to pull in some of the highest ranking men around. Many had strong political positions and were extremely wealthy. Behind closed doors, they drank and proposed new tax plans. And Francis' goal was to prove to the world that his secret club could be more politically powerful and influential than the church or the highest ranking noblemen. And to create more public interest in his club, they began spreading more rumors about their secret meetings. Soon, Francis wanted membership numbers to grow, so they needed a bigger space than the George and Vulture venue. He would still keep his inner circle at 12 men, but he wanted to invite more high-ranking members under his wing. Some of the most notable members were John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. He was, at the time, he was known for heavy drinking and gambling, but he later became much more famous because during one of his gambling sessions, he had such a long gambling and drinking session that he had to order some servants to go get him some food. They brought back a plate of meat, and bread because he just wanted to keep trucking for as long as he could he must have been winning some chips that night so he just wanted to keep going and keep drinking so he didn't have any utensils because he probably had you know some port wine in one hand and he only <laughs> had one hand free so as he reached over to eat he grabbed the bread and then with the bread he grabbed the meat and that is the legend of the first sandwich really isn't that crazy that and could've I've always wondered about that, where the sandwich came from. Yeah, wow. that's that's what they think might have been the first iteration. And it possibly could have been at a Hellfire Club meeting, for all we know. Wow. It's pretty crazy. Another famous member was John Wilkes. He was a writer and politician who later inspired the American Revolution, crazy enough. And we'll see a little bit later how John Montague and John Wilkes didn't get along, but we'll, uh, we'll keep the membership drama on the, on the back end here. <laughs> <laughs> Another member was Francis Duffield. Lots of Francis's in this time right, period. I know. The Prince of Wales' personal doctor. In 1751, Francis Duffield gifted Francis Dashwood a monastery out in West Wickham, 36 miles from London. There was already a stone structure there called the Med Medum Abbey. But to make it even more mysterious, Francis had tunnels and secret chambers excavated beneath the building. This excavation took years to complete. And to keep the tunnels a secret, he paid the workers for their silence. Once these tunnels were finished, Francis hung this new motto over the abbey, which I find hilarious, but it was just, it was Latin, but it translated to do what thou wilt, or do what you want to do, essentially. And that was seen as kind of a blasphemy, because on a lot of buildings at the time, especially an abbey or some uh, religious building, it was more like, Whatever you do is always because God is deeming it or it's, it's your work is credited to God in some way. So just saying like, do what you want to do right. was you know, people like, were like, whoa, fuck God, do what you want. Yeah. 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 So people saw it that way, like a huge blasphemy. He also planted all these statues of Egyptian and Roman gods that surrounded the building to show that they weren't even connected to a faith and they met. As far as we know, we think they met here and in these tunnels roughly every Wednesday and Saturday, but only during the summer months because once it got too cold, they're like, I don't want to go down to the tunnels anymore. And they were probably, I don't know, rich, snobby men. They didn't they're like, where are my fancy furs? I'm not taking them down to the tunnels. Members would dress in white robes and then they'd march down into the monastery two at a time shoulder to shoulder and they they usually went down with their torches lit they kind of wanted to make a ceremony if any onlookers watched as they were going and they sure. wanted to look a little spooky as they were going in there as they passed the iron gates and headed down into the tunnels they chanted the latin phrase penitento non penitentio which translates to a tense penis not penitence which penitence is basically the feeling sorrow it's what you need to be forgiven essentially so really these were kind of just some frat so is that bros. like a latin way of saying an erection <laughs> yeah tense penis yeah so penitento so they're going down there with their tense penises <laughs> yeah. to have some fun <laughs> yes they're ready and they're inviting women down there for this or sure enough yeah i'll we'll see 
Mm, mm. Once inside, the excavations beneath the abbey were filled with confusing twists and turns, and these tunnels still exist today. And they head into a maze of tunnels, dead ends, and secret chambers. Some of the deepest areas reach 300 feet beneath the surface, and no one knows exactly why these tunnels were built the way they were. Some think the workers connected caverns to old chalk mines that existed beneath the building a few years before. Some think it was designed after an ancient subterranean Greek temple, and others believe there is a more symbolic purpose for the layout. Maybe the tunnels formed a symbolic picture when viewed from above, just like Francis's garden. Others say it symbolizes human anatomy and represents the journey of birth. Deeper into the system, a quarter mile tunnel passes a small alcove, a roundabout in a cave. The tunnel leads to a bigger room, a 1200 square foot banquet hall with 40 foot ceilings. The room was designed to be directly beneath the property's graveyard. Many who enter here begin to experience cold temperatures. No natural light reaches the banquet hall and without a torch or a candle, visitors can experience complete darkness. Even deeper, the tunnels lead to a flooded walkway that looks like a dead end. Here, a boatman would ferry club members across the water, which they called the River Styx. The name referenced the Greek mythological river of the underworld. Once they crossed the water, the members made it to the entrance of the secret inner temple. Only 12 of the highest ranking members were allowed here, and there was once a chapel with stained glass windows and statues of the 12 members committing sexual acts. In one of the alcoves, they stashed one of the largest porn collections known to man at the time. Across from that was a large wine cellar, and along the tunnel walls were plaques of Latin messages that translated blasphemies or told strange stories. Some were gibberish and didn't translate to anything at all. But down in these secret rooms, Francis was known to reference two different gods, Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, and Venus, the goddess known for seduction and lust. Rumors spread that Francis held rituals where they made blood sacrifices to Bacchus and Venus, and with the rumors came even more popularity. And just like Francis wanted, new members came flooding in. Many were members of royalty or parliament, and it was required that they attend an initiation ceremony. No records exist of what went on during these ceremonies. Some stories suggest that two men would be brought into a private chamber to debate. After the debate, the members would vote on the best argument, and whoever won was initiated. And as the membership grew, so did the raging parties. Francis began throwing large orgies. They brought in prostitutes called the nuns, of course. The sex workers would wear abbots, while the members would wear monks' robes, and they would drink wine from the sex workers' belly buttons. Others would drink Francis's famous cocktail, Brimstone. And through the night, they would get hammered and have sex until passing out. By the next morning, they would initiate another member while they were all hung over. And by the following meeting, they'd start it all over again. Sometimes they would put on shows where the sex workers would perform sexual acts on a small stage as the devils cheered them on. Strange enough, the members were all encouraged to pick only one partner for each celebration. If any of the members tried to flirt with another member's partner, they were punished and shunned for the night. One of Francis' usual partners was his own stepmother, Mary Dashwood, and he loved drawing attention to the fact that she was a stepmother because it was taboo. The Hellfire Club supposedly practiced mystic rituals during these orgies. One member who signed their name as Morlock wrote a letter to a friend. In the letter, he claimed the club performed a ritual called the Sacrifice of the Maidens. Some believe this meant they committed human sacrifice. Others thought it was a ceremony where they took a young woman's virginity, and they did it while cursing and pledging their allegiance to pagan gods. Adding to the rumors, Francis would invite noble women to the parties and require them to be naked at all times. At the time, this was seen as even more scandalous than having sex workers at the parties. Then in a drunken speech to everyone, he would encourage all the women to have sex with the devil. Meanwhile, at these parties, servers would set tables with a bunch of food. One meal was the breast of Venus, and it was a pair of roasted poultry breasts with red cherries for the nipples. Another famous dish was the devil's loins, which was roast beef that was carved into the shape of a human butt. And it goes without saying that along with these meals, there was just a slew of alcoholic drinks as well that was presented to oh, the yeah, crew. Oh yeah, sure. And that's how they had fun. It just sounds like a sex club, basically. Yeah, sounds like a, a weird like anti-religious frat. But yeah, they just love banging. <laughs> As years passed, Francis struggled with his blasphemies and his belief in God. 
During Hellfire Club meetings, he would defy God, but in private, he secretly prayed and wished he could be closer to God. So about five years after forming the London Hellfire Club, he decided to give back to the church. West Wickham's local church of St. Lawrence was run down. Its old roof was nearly gone, so Francis funded a new roof with a golden cap. It's unknown if this was a PR move or a way to get back into God's good graces. Only Francis knew his true motivations. But meanwhile, the Hellfire Club raged on. The one final prank between two feuding members would soon cause its downfall. The main prankster was John Wilkes, a famous journalist and politician, and he wanted to get back at John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. The Earl was known as the biggest poser of the group. He always tried to act like he was the most scandalous member who loved the devil, but everyone knew he was secretly dedicated to God. So John decided to expose his hypocrisy. One night, John drunkenly dared the Earl to lock himself in one of the tunnel's cells, and the Earl agreed to prove he wasn't a coward. Other members watched as the Earl stumbled through the dark tunnel mazes late at night. He headed towards the cells near one of the chambers where he spotted John Wilkes sitting across the room from a large wooden chest. The chest made soft thumping noises and the Earl could hear breathing coming from inside it. When he slowly approached and reached to open it, a giant inhuman creature burst out of the chest. The figure tackled the Earl to the ground and clawed at his clothing. In a panic, the Earl tossed the hairy creature toward an opposite hallway and scrambled into the darkness. The Earl had no idea what it was, but he thought it might have been the devil trying to drag him to the depths of hell. So John Wilkes ended up getting what he wanted because as the Earl was fleeing out of the temple, he said, quote, Spare me, gracious devil. Spare a wretch who never was sincerely your servant. I sinned only from vanity of being in the fashion. Thou knowest I never have been half so wicked as I pretended. Never have been able to commit the thousandth part of the vices which I have boasted of. Leave me, therefore, and go to those who are more truly devoted to your service. I am but half a sinner. So basically he admitted, I'm a fraud. And I love how in the end of his confession, he says, I'm but half a sinner. Yeah. I'm still a sinner, but not, I'm not as hardcore as I'm you I'm only 50% a sinner. <laughs> yeah. I'm a godly man on the other hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The other men laughed at the Earl as he fled. And when they later caught the creature, they saw it was only a baboon that John Wilkes had dressed in a devil costume. And John also admitted to opening the chest with an invisible string. In response, the Earl would demand John Wilkes' resignation from his political position. And it's believed the Earl tipped off authorities about John printing off pornographic pamphlets exclusively for the Hellfire Club. The pamphlet was called an essay on woman, which contained pornographic parodies. Many were deeply misogynistic, and it often described public figures performing lewd sex acts. Most of the pamphlet was poetry, and he wrote in couplets. So you'll get a kick out of this one. This is, quote, The latent traits the pleasing depths explore, and my prick chapped where thousands were before. Prick chapped. His, his prick is chapped. He's... The I mean, language of, that these guys use is right? just, it's, it's just hard not to laugh at it. It's no, like, it's ridiculous. This guy's saying, it, I have a chapped prick because I've been having so much sex. <laughs> <laughs> Too much raw dog in there. Yeah. God. And this is the Earl tattled on him. He's like, he's, he's printing off dirty pamphlets. Go arrest him. <laughs> this is like, these are the feuds these guys are having. Oh my God, man. So London police found John and confiscated the 12 copies. Since many high-ranking politicians were mentioned in the book, he was charged with seditious libel. He saw that his career was ruined and he would soon be kicked out of his position in Parliament. And if he was going down, the Earl and the entire Hellfire Club was going with him. So in 1763, he published an expose on the entire club. He mentioned all the blasphemous things inside the monastery and the tunnels beneath, and he exposed all the orgies and debaucheries that each member took part of. And a lot of the info that we have on the Hellfire Club today is from his expose. Now that the club's secrecy was ruined, they had fewer and fewer meetings, and a heavier cloud of shame hung over the club. But like always, the publicity got the club more attention, and Benjamin Franklin soon became interested. It was known Benjamin Franklin had multiple affairs and often hired sex workers throughout his life. He was also known for his interest in secret societies and was a member of the Freemasons. It's unclear if he was ever an official member of the Hellfire Club, but he was most likely drawn to the club's orgies. And he got along great with the leader, Francis Dashwood. 
He even lived with him briefly in a guest house on Francis' estate in West Wickham. There's no telling how far Ben Franklin dove into the occult or potential devil worship, but rumors say it had a much darker side than he cared to admit. In 1998, 15 corpses were discovered in the basement of his London house at 36 Craven Street. Some believe they were used for an illegal anatomy school that his roommate ran out of his home, but others think the school might have been a cover-up for occult sacrifices, and his connection to the Hellfire Club might have had something to do with it. But the Hellfire Club soon fell apart. John Wilkes fled to his daughter's house and was tried in absentia for his pamphlet. In 1764, he was expelled from the House of Commons, and he was found guilty of libel. He later joined a movement against the king and supported democracy in the American Revolution, and he became a popular political figure. His support of democracy went on to inspire the founding fathers of the United States. He returned to England in 1767 and served two years in prison, but he kept up his political career until 1790. By 1766, the Hellfire Club quickly faded away. Running for over four decades, the Hellfire Club was finally over. The feud between John Montague and John Wilkes tore the club apart. The bad press brought too much attention to the club, but it's not clear what exactly happened between all the members. The club's record keeper, Paul Whitehead, later fell ill and ended up burning all the records. He feared that the documents would fall into the wrong hands when he died, and their deepest secrets would be exposed. So the club's darkest secrets died along with its members. As one last fixture to the property, Francis later placed a statue of Paul near the entrance to the secret tunnels. And by 1781, these tunnels had become a popular tourist spot. The dark and twisted rumors brought in visitors from across the world. But by then, most of the artwork, pornography, wine, and any trace of occult ceremonies had been removed. All that was left were a few plaques, the pitch black tunnels, and the spirits that haunted them. Legend has it that the Hellfire members had placed Paul Whitehead's heart in an urn locked in a mausoleum on the Hellfire property. The urn had an epitaph that read, quote, Unhallowed hands this urn forbear, no gems or orient spirit lie here concealed, but what's more rare, a heart that knew no guile. So what I get from that, I think uh, Paul Whitehead was actually just a super dedicated and loyal member of the crew. And that last act of burning the records was probably seen as a, a noble thing to do. But I think that's where a lot of the rumors potentially come from. It's like, what was so bad that right. even though we've had this expose and everything, what was actually so bad that he felt the need to burn even more records? Clearly not everything was out in the open. So I think that's where a lot of the suspicions and mystery come from. It's like, what was, what was on there? What were they really doing? murder i i would i would think like that that's would be a huge possibility i would agree i mean they're already you know they're dancing with the devil and add alcohol to that yep you know i'm sure there were some violent violent things that went down yeah and they were they were trying to gain political power too so i wouldn't be surprised if they were trying to kill some political enemies, yeah possibly, assassinations like and things that. like that yeah, yeah probably probably was i mean there's they knew that they would probably, if that ever got out, that they, the authorities would hunt down every single one of them and right. eventually try to get the truth about what was going on down there. Exactly. Hmm. When the tourists began flooding in, an American visitor supposedly stole the heart from the mausoleum. Of course it was an American, right? <laughs> and now Paul's ghost haunts the mausoleum, gardens, and tunnels forever, searching for a stolen heart. Another legend that lives on is the story of Suki. One of the plaques left behind in the tunnels mentioned a servant girl who also worked at a nearby alehouse called the George and Dragon in West Wickham. She was charming, attractive, and smart. And even though all the local men wanted to marry her, she wanted to catch the eye of a rich nobleman. She turned down every local man that approached her, and her plan was to keep her virginity until she could marry. Every time she turned the local men down, they grew more irritated with her. One day when a nobleman came into the alehouse for a drink, Suki began flirting with him and all the other men raged with jealousy. After the noblemen left, the other men conspired against them. They sent Suki a forged love letter and signed it in the nobleman's name. The letter told her to meet him in the Hellfire Caves and wear a wedding dress. They would elope and move far away from West Wickham. When Suki arrived, she headed into the open caves and searched for her lover, but she soon realized she had been tricked. As she left the tunnels, the local men ambushed her. They threw rocks toward her until one struck her in the head and she instantly died. It's now believed that Suki's ghost roams the tunnels, 
and occasionally she's been seen at the Georgian Dragon. Odd mists and distorted figures have also been spotted in the Hellfire Tunnels, and a white wedding gown has been seen whipping around sharp corners. Some visitors have asked if the tunnels host weddings, not realizing the woman they had seen in the wedding gown was an apparition. And in the deepest parts of the tunnel beyond the river Styx, some have heard disembodied voices whispering in the inner temple. In the final years of Francis's life, he began seeing a white apparition floating through the trees of his estate. One time he caught a glimpse of the figure's face, and he was surprised to see it was the club's record keeper, Paul Whitehead. Francis had fallen ill in his 70s, and he believed Paul's ghost was calling him to the afterlife. Or maybe Paul was a guilty reminder of all the sin and blasphemy they committed during the Hellfire Club days. In November 1781, the rest of Francis's family also claimed they had seen the apparition floating around the estate grounds, and by the next month, Francis passed away. Soon after his death, his nephew Joseph Alderson created the Phoenix Society. It was founded to honor Francis Dashwood and his club. Their meetings were much more tame than Hellfires, though. But there was one important tradition that they carried on. Excessive drinking. At least one member later died from alcohol poisoning. The club still exists today as a dining club at Brazenose College, Oxford. Other sister branches of the Hellfire Club formed after Francis's death, and it's believed that many of these offshoots continue the dark traditions of the Hellfire Club. Some were even involved in church burnings and cannibalism, and the centuries-old rumors have continued to inspire other clubs and occult philosophers across the world. Even the infamous occultist, Aleister Crowley, carried on the club's motto, Do what thou wilt. Very interesting. Isn't that nuts? I'm, I'm even like more interested in secret societies now after this one. And I always come back to, I know I've mentioned this movie before, but Eyes Wide Shut. Oh, I, yeah. It just touches on that terrifying mystery of secret societies so well that, I don't know, yeah, there, it, and it's usually a lot of it is sex driven as well. Oh, yeah. And I don't know, it just terrifies me that these potentially just still exist out here and we just don't know about them. Well, there's always, you know, talk of the Illuminati, right? Which right. the Illuminati is a, was actually a real secret society. And, you know, according to what we know about it, it ended a long time ago, but obviously people still believe this secret society exists today. And yeah. that's, you know, and Jay-Z is a part of it. Right. Shit, yeah. Right. You know, celebrities and people from Hollywood, you know, are all involved in it and they, Hosts these wild parties where wild things happen, much like the Hellfire Club. I could believe it. And, you know, it goes beyond, you know, I've, I've seen videos of people who attend these parties and stuff, supposedly, and, you know, they say they're pretty wild that, you know, blood is involved and sex is involved and, you know, they do rituals and things like that. So I, I tend to believe that this stuff continues to this day in different forms and different, under different names. And, you know, obviously there's a lot, a lot of people out there who are like, oh, there's nothing to this. It's just all rumors. You know, there's skull and bones, secret society as well, which a lot of presidents have come out of, uh, which is interesting. I know a lot of them were Freemasons, right? Yeah, yeah. a ton of Freemasons. Yeah. My grandfather's a Freemason. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, he's also a Shriner. He like joined every fraternal society. <laughs> he wanted possible. his hands and everything. Yeah. I mean, he just, I think he just did it for the, to have the name, you know? Yeah. But and I think, I mean, that's a part of it, right? It's the, right? yeah, the elitism and, and obviously the secrecy plays into that. But yeah, that's, I always think about that and the, whatever they actually are doing, you know, obviously we'll never know the truth as far as the Hellfire Club goes, but yeah, it's, it's that thing with like burning records and secrecy that it, it kind of just lets your imagination run wild. So it does. It makes you think, I mean, they called it the Hellfire Club. And obviously, based on what we know, it was kind of like the club that was the opposite of the church, right? Like they're yeah. trying to do everything the church didn't want you to do. It's just how deep, how deeply disturbing did that club get? You know, right. how how deep into sin did they go? Did I I imagine they went all the way at least a few times. It seemed right? to be the goal, right? And if it, it's just, the Francis Dashwood saying, I'm banging my stepmother. Like he, <laughs> they, it seemed like they went pretty far as far as they could, especially behind closed doors. Or was it just, you know, kind of a, 
facade you know they're just trying to make it look like it's really this horrific evil place but yet i mean sex orgies and things like that is not evil inherently but who know i mean banging your stepmother like you just said and <laughs> incest is another thing right. but but yeah like what is the extent that it went to is, is the real question i think you can get really lost in the sauce and you know yeah. thinking about what they were actually doing were they doing these dark rituals where they were sacrificing women or you know worse down it, there and it could have just been i don't know i do get like frat bro vibes from these yeah. guys well where, that's what it i mean it sounds like from the stories we were just talking about yeah and it's like we even know and the initiation ceremonies for modern frats or yeah. sororities are yeah. like a big thing and hazing and stuff like that and yeah and, my, my other podcast model higher we were just talking about penn state and oh yeah the hazing deaths that they've had there is absolutely insane, insane stuff right? they put their members through just to join a fraternity is yeah like, and, and i mean i called it straight evil what they were doing i mean they're literally like torturing their members to like waterboarding them and then when they're in need of help they're just leaving them there to die it's just it's insane yeah it's like i've also heard like they force uh people members to initiate they have to kill animals and stuff like yeah, that too yeah, yeah, yeah super dark there was a uh, one guy that came out and said that they would make their members go and uh get like a baby squirrel raise it up and then murder it like curb stomp it yeah that's insane which is just evil yeah. it's like what does that prove other than you're a you're sick fuck yeah, right like, so yeah it's crazy we could draw parallels between yeah hellfire club and a, a frat you could you call know? the you know most frats the hellfire club honestly yeah, honestly like, excessive drinking yeah there you go yeah sex parties probably yeah. a lot of them talking like, about how uh, their dicks get chapped after yeah. banging so many people you know <laughs> They're tense pricks, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or whatever they yeah, call. Yeah, yeah. Penny Tento, yeah, the, the tense penis, yeah. Bunch of well, and that's boys. what that's what people say is like when you know you talk about the Freemasons and stuff. There's a lot of people who are like, you know, it's just a fraternity. Like, there's nothing evil going on there. Yeah, it's just an exclusive skull and bone too. society. But when you dig into the histories a bit, especially you go back to the beginning, there's always some. You know, it's a little bit darker uh, than you would think. Yeah, for sure. So. You know, I wouldn't be surprised and say definitely capable of very evil acts, including murder, human sacrifice, and blood rituals and things like that. Yeah. Danny, what's your take on this society? Uh, kind of off topic, but my uncle is actually a member of the Freemasons too, and he's been trying to get me to join for the last two years or so. And Oh, really? Yeah, I just he wants me to join the Denver chapter and reach out, but I just I have no interest in it. What's uh, the holdup? I'm not a big I don't want to be in a frat <laughs> yeah, yeah right but I mean I think nowadays specifically with the Freemasons I don't think it's probably like a deep dark societal mm, yeah. I think it's more of just a modern day boys club now yeah. I think back in the 1700s you know especially the Hellfire Club I think they were definitely doing some human sacrifice and some dark stuff I mean one of their members was blatantly willing to kill someone in public so imagine what they're doing behind closed doors right it just, it just, well, yeah the problem why? was the public murder right yeah, yeah yeah but what were you gonna say i was gonna say what's the point of building these tunnels too like the amount of work that went into the hellfire tunnels yeah. is like it's a lot just to build a party space you right know I mean? yeah like, and they were like crafting the sculptures of them having sex and like really souping it up you know and, the, and there must have been more purposes for that than like why not just build a big room underground and call it the hellfire club you know what i mean yeah, why true. build all these tunnels in a maze and and then the secret the river that you have to cross yeah only certain it's really impressive honestly like yeah. what they were what they created back then i mean and that it's still around today where yeah. you can go and visit it and take tours of it i would love like to that, that sounds yeah. like a blast honestly i know i know they have like mannequins and stuff in there now they try and like recreate scenes of what we yeah. think was happening down they got, there like red light glowing in there yeah i've i've heard some i don't know some people say like sometimes the mannequins move or something like yeah. that but yes some people think there's some energy down there but it's definitely a paranormal hotspot. I mean, a ton of people have gone down there and and recorded not not only disembodied voices, but shadow figures is a big, big one that there's like one corridor. Um, I think we were talking about earlier that like eight foot shadow figures oh, show really? up. Yeah. Damn. So it, it does make you wonder. It's like, 
you know, maybe they got the Ouija board out and they're doing some <laughs> some drunken Ouija it board always sessions. Always comes and, back, yeah. They go back into the inner yeah. sanctum and yeah, they're just doing Ouija, just unleashing. Because they think the idea is like they they opened a portal to hell down there, right? Yeah, like yeah. There's you know this gateway that's been opened up by the Hellfire Club that's still open to this day. Yeah, that'd be a, you know there's all these evil spirits down there. Yeah, but yeah, definitely a spot on the bucket list. I'd say to to visit sweet ireland as well i'd like to see that lodge That's, that lodge sounds really, really a lot cool. of the yeah so i know the hunting lodge is still there i don't think the original original tavern is still there but it, it might be um but yeah as far as we know that hunting lodge and this abbey with the tunnels still exist to this day um it's often confused because when um people don't always get it right because they think that the church that francis dashwood helped he paid for some money to get the new yeah, golden cap right. and stuff on they think that like that's the hellfire club but it's not so there's a lot of confusion on which buildings were used but we're fairly certain that obviously the tunnels are still there so it's that medmenham abbey and then the hunting lodge is definitely still there it's sad enough though it's it's kind of a little ransacked people have like littered the grounds and there's graffiti and stuff yeah and stuff i like saw that. that from some of the the video i was watching yeah of course people do that you yeah know, any site that becomes a paranormal hotspot i feel like eventually gets ruined yeah for sure if it's not maintained but yeah let us know out there if you've been to the hellfire tunnels and what your experience was because i hear a lot of creepy things that go on down there and there's it's quite an active spot for paranormal activity so let us know in the comments below if you're watching on youtube but that is it for us today we'll be back with another dark one for you next week until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>